we've gone through a few talks in the morning and talked about uh, various uh, regions of India and associated problems. Uh, fortunately, the situation is not so aggravated in Tulu Nadu. Primarily Tulu Nadu, I am referring to the two coastal districts of uh, Karnataka, Dakshina Kannada district and Udupi district. Roughly, that is what comprises Tulu Nadu. There are uh, some portions of uh, North Kerala, Kasurgod, for example, from a cultural point of view, can be considered uh, Tulu Nadu. And then as we move north from Udupi, there are some regions which have a lot of uh, commonality. But the core of Tulu Bhumi is, uh, you know, comprises these two districts. So, um, I mean, Devagruha, because uh, it, it's almost like a microcosm of India itself, each and every form of worship that you will find elsewhere is found and found in abundance in uh, Tulu Nadu. There is Vedic worship, there is a Vedantic uh, form of practice, there is Agamic uh, practice thriving there. Then, uh, you know, non-Vedic forms uh, of worship of deities is very prevalent, uh, some of which is in common uh, commonality with Kerala. And I'll touch about that uh, also a little bit. So each and every form of worship that uh, possibly can be in a place is found in Tulu Nadu. And that's why people flock to that area whenever they have problems. Typically what you do with, the, you know, how you rush to your uh, puja griha. So that's why I termed it as the... Devagruha of Bharata Bhumi itself. Uh, it's a very culturally alive and um, you know uh, spiritually active region. Uh, all the problems that we discuss do exist there. I mean, temples controlled by the government, uh, quite a few temples uh, not being taken care of well. All those problems do exist, but on a relative scale, I would say uh, the, the uh, cultural element is very very strong uh, in Tulna. So I will be uh, talking from two main uh, aspects. One is an introduction into our temple system. Uh, like I said, some of you from Kerala may find it uh, very familiar, but uh, there are still some unique aspects and some, some differences. And then uh, a take on why possibly, uh, you know, it is still surviving and thriving. You know, what could be the reasons and uh, what could be the unique uh, attributes of the practice there that has um, you know, contributed to this situation. Yeah. So um, the, quite a number of people have done some good research. I have I've taken the liberty to borrow some material from them. So uh, you know there are a number of uh, inscriptions that uh, have been uncovered from as early as uh, the third century BC, uh, which shows that there was uh, you know uh, primitive forms of uh, worship in uh, Tulu Nadu. Uh, obviously, the richness is attributed to, um, you know, it being a part of the Parushrama Kshetra. I think, again, more than one speaker has referred to it. Uh, there is um, some dispute about where the Parushrama Kshetra starts and where it ends, but uh, there is no dispute that uh, Kerala and Tulunad belong to it. So, Gokarna to Cape Comorin is one commonly accepted, uh, you know, definition of uh, Tulunad. And uh, because, um, you know, Parushrama asked for the ocean to make space, uh, the belief is that, uh, you know, that that region uh, was was handed over by Parashurama to Rishis. So we have a tradition where we say the, the, the region below the ghats below, is of the Rishi Parampara and the region above the ghats in Karnataka and elsewhere is from the Raja Parampara. In fact, you can see that in many of the practices in, in above the ghats, uh, the focus is more on uh, puja and then you know, uh, the women also participate that much more. When you move into the coastal region, into the ghats, it's uh, more of agamic worship. It's more uh, yajnas and havanas and, you know, uh, purascharanas and japas and so on. So there's clearly a, a link between uh, rishi-based practices and, uh, you know, uh, raja-based, uh, you know, uh, practices. So uh, that possibly explains some of the uniqueness of uh, what we do in uh, Parashurama Kshetra and specifically in Tulnad. So it is believed that uh, some of the Brahmins, uh, they were brought to this region. Uh, again, there's a controversy about who actually uh, brought them over, but there are a lot of, uh, uh, you know, written records which show clearly that uh, Brahmins from the north came down and then that's when the temple worship and the worship of deities, Vedic deities, uh, picked up more in uh, Parashurama Kshetra. 
uh, what existed before that also exists today and that part uh, that that forms a part of uh, my uh, talk today and uh, you know uh, there pos the biggest possible reason for why it is uh, so strongly pre prevalent still is that uh, religion and spirituality is part of every single aspect of life you know it's not like i've heard many people who say you know i am i am spiritual i am a dharmic when i get up in the morning and finish my prayers after that i am a different person we have a different take on this whatever we do you know religion and spirituality is involved in this for us even sport uh, is is uh, spirituality and religion based our kambala many of you are famous there's a deva kambala there's a daiva kambala our, uh, uh, there's a kori katta which is like a fight between uh, you know cocks that is also you know conducted during temple festival so each and every aspect of what we do has a link with the gods and temples and deities that possibly explains the um, you know strong uh, retention still so the first uh, i'll cover a few introductory details about the temples itself uh, the uniqueness of uh, uh, tulnad is that there are hundreds and hundreds of uh, temples which are still in worship and each of them being centuries old we do have regions elsewhere also where like you know there's no shortage of temples i agree but um, you know there's some research done which shows that uh, there are so many temples still in active worship but their idols are you know at least the 13th uh, century or even earlier so that i find very very uh, rare uh, in india where so many temples are actively in worship and some of the traditions are completely unbroken um, yeah, udupi in fact uh, today is the 19th yesterday we we had the pariyaya system that's a unique practice which is uh, you know done in the U udupi krishna mata temple premises Uh, 750 odd years it's been unbroken every two years uh, one out of the eight um, yatis the swami ji is from the udupi sampradaya takes over the worship uh, in and in exactly the same way every single day 14 times the puja of udupi shri krishna takes place so uh, that's just one example there are my own uh, you know uh, village where i come from uh, one of the researchers p gurraj but he has uh, estimated that the ganapati idol that we have is at least uh, you know from the 13th century and um, you know my family has a history of about 250 300 years since we've been worshiping we don't have records about who was worshiping before that but uh, from the idol itself now we know that uh, at least 700 plus years uh, that temple has been uh, alive so we have you know uh, almost in every big village at least we have a, a temple like this and a, a story to go along with so um i have mentioned some of the main gods here um, that are worship the the number of forms that i have mentioned here are not the number of temples but the variations in the in in the form of the god itself that is worship so shiva for example it could be you know vishwanatha or lokeshwara somnatha manjunatha and so on that itself is about 45 different forms and again i am not referring to the recently started ones but the ancient temples and so uh, out of these i am mean, using these forms there are probably hundreds of shiva temples we have durga worship very very uh, prevalent i think the previous speaker was mentioning that in bengal uh, the temples are not uh, numerous the durga temples it's opposite in tulnad the second most prevalent form of i mean deity whose worshiped is uh, durga and then we have at least 15 main forms of vishnu who's worship and then uh, subramanya ganapati and then uh, surya and shastra temples are also found in abundance shankara narayana is again a very unique form of worship in the same temple we have in the same idol uh, you know it's equivalent to hari hara we call it shankara narayana lots and lots of temples of uh, shankara narayana in south kendra so the worship is primarily based on agama tantra um, So increasingly some, some you know uh, vedic practices are coming in more i mean i agree that agamic practice is also vedic uh, very much vedic in nature but then the concept of doing uh, more havanas yagnas the samhita parayanas and few other vedic practices they have also uh, they, they are also increasing uh, but primarily it is based on the tantra samuchaya which is the same as what uh, is used in uh, kerala so just a representation of few idols the reason i wanted to show these four is uh, you know one is a vishnu murti idol 
that's our typical way of you know carving out an idol and then worshiping it the one on the right is a uh, ishwara uh, and and it's obviously a linga form not a murti form the third one here on the left side is actually a durga uh, temple durga murti but behind it is actually a stone so uh, that's again a unique uh, you know uh, attribute of tulunad the 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 deity present in a temple is determined by the sannidhana and not by the form or shape so there could be a linga but it could as well be a durga temple or even a subramanya temple so uh, one such similar temple we've obviously put a you know metal uh, murti in front of it but the mula sannidhana is actually just a stone but the deity is a durga and similarly the fourth image it's difficult to spot it there but it's actually a, a ganapati temple and it's a you know uh, uh, idol and and not a stone uh, you know it, it's a chala murti not a not not a in, immovable murti and it's in fact from um, a, a village where the uh, the idol in the house of the main archaka uh, was came to be determined as the temple for the village itself so uh, you know it's actually the puja graha of a house and that's the temple for the whole village so a lot of unique uh, variations in uh, you know in the form of idols which are worshiped there's some controversy about uh, udupi krishna idol itself some people have objected saying it's a subramanya idol and so it's actually subramanya but i like, like i said uh, in tulnad it's not determined by how the idol looks but who comes and sits inside that okay so uh, from the idols i'll you know a quick introduction into the forms of worship we have three main forms of worshiping in uh, temples we call it the anga puja the ranga puja and the utsava puja so anga puja and utsava puja is still practiced elsewhere ranga puja i believe is still unique to our region uh, in the anga puja the, the worship happens inside the garbhagriha obviously the archaka and uh, maybe one or two of his close assistants will have access so it's uh, it's not open to all in the traditional sense um in the in north india we do have the practice of everyone going in and participating in the puja that is uh, strictly not how it works in uh, in our area so you know only the archaka has access to the main idol and the garbhagriha and the daily pujas and all the you know routines take place there then we have the i'll cover the utsava puja first uh, because i have a more detailed slide as well so that's when the deity you know completely comes out the utsava murti comes out that's the exact opposite of the anga puja and the whole village all the communities can participate so there's like you can see that there is like a scale uh, of participation as well and in between these two is the ranga puja that that picture is just to show you what happens there so the ranga puja actually comes uh, i mean depending on the implementation it can actually come till the vajra stambha of the temple i mean there are again versions of the ranga puja but you decorate the whole place a few more people than just the archaka participate in that i mean the seva kartrus of course and there are few more people uh, there is lot of uh, deepas that are lit and you know there is there is naivedya that's laid out there but essentially the scale of participation is more than the anga puja but less than the utsava this is um, uh, not so prevalent at all elsewhere i i, I have reason to believe that this is unique uh, as of today to tulunad just one point uh, maybe the last slide so uh, another unique aspect uh, in these temples is the strong identification of people and certain roles for them and the emphasis that those people only perform those uh, aspects of uh, temple worship so we have the archakas adigas or asranas who are the traditional uh, you know worshipers in the temple and then during the annual festival we have the tantris who will come in they 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 come from a um, um family set of um, you know people who are designated to officiate in our utsavas and chatris so it has to be from the you know somebody identified as a tantri then there are people identified for management itself you know typically that is sometimes hereditary but typically the most uh, powerful or influential person in the village then there are people who are designated to lift the palaki to to uh, you know hoist the dhwaja bring down the dhwaja people who are uh, specifically uh, uh, you know appointed to handle the musical instruments during the festival all community based 
and uh, strongly identified with those uh, people even to this day. So the Utsava again, uh, the, the original idea was that on the day when the temple was consecrated, from then on, you know, every year there would be a Utsava on that day. Of course, we do have the concept of a Jirnodhara where after 12 years, renovation is done and then the Sanidana is uh, rejuvenated. But the Utsava still happens, you know, based on the day the temple was originally um, conceived to have been, you know, to placed there. So it could range from four days to even a month. There are some temples, uh, one month out of uh, 12 is, uh, you know, Utsava period. So typically four to five is seven perhaps is, is a more common number. And then uh, what happens here is, um, I mean, again, a lot of rituals and routine, but the key element there is that it is believed that the deity comes out of the Garbha Gruha during the Utsava period. And then there are his uh, ganas and you know assistant devatas who are around the temple. So he not only visits and assures the villagers, but also, you know, oversees the worship of these other devatas and ganas during the Utsavas. That is the main purpose of a Utsava and the main reason why the deity comes out during that. Not just the people participating, but his own upaganas and upadevatas get to participate in celebrating his festival. So, four key um, events are the hoisting of the Dwaja, we call it the Kodi and uh, the Bali Utsava, the, the rounds that go on uh, around the temple uh, every day of the Utsava. And then there is a main Rathotsava that happens and then a very grand fourth day, uh, multiple events on that day, but two key events is the Avabrata Snana when the deity goes to his uh, official pond or pool, however you want to call it, uh, and then the bringing down of the Dwaja itself. So uh, this is one aspect of uh, temple, uh, the devatas and uh, uh, the, their aradhane. A second integral aspect of uh, Tulunadu temple worship is what we call as the daiva aradhane. Now uh, it is not strictly connected with temples itself, but it has so happened over the past several centuries that the aradhana of daivas uh, happens in every temple. Now. Um, the word daiva, we also call it bhuta, uh, there are, though there are some people who object to the uh, term bhuta because it's misconstrued these days. Although in Sanskrit and Shastra bhuta, the word bhuta can stand for anyone from Parabrahma himself to the elements. You know, the, the, it's a wonderful word. So that way I don't see any, you know, offense in uh, calling these uh, ganas as bhutas. Uh, so every temple will have one or more bhutas along associated along with the devata. So the typical Puranic story is that these uh, ganas which were thousand and one in number were sent down by Shiva uh, to take care of the people in Tulunad and then they you know went all over the region and then each house in Tulunadu and each temple in Tulunadu will have one or more of these uh, bhutas as we call it. Their worship is an extremely intricate part of uh, our culture, you know. So uh, the reason this has got, gotten along well, I think there have been some research done on, uh, you know, how uh, the Vedic worship of Vedic deities and this totally non-Vedic worship have come together. But uh, primarily the belief is that these are Vayavya Jivas, I mean, like we are Parthiva Jivas, out of the five elements, earth is the primary element in our body. Whereas the Devatas are uh, Taijasika, Agni Tattva is the main element in their body. It is believed that these Bhutas and Kanas, Vayu is the primary element. And um, whoever has a Vayavya Jiva prefers uh, action, prefers Cheshta. So, if, you know, I'll show you a couple of uh, photographs, but uh, their worship is mainly called as the Bhuta Nema or the Bhuta Kola, which involves, a, you know, uh, it's equivalent to a possession of a deity and then pleasing him with the uh, uh, form of a dance, uh, like the Theyam, I believe, in Kerala. So I think it's perfectly explainable within the dharmic framework of why that form of worship is uh, acceptable. And that could possibly also explain why that it has gotten along so well with the temple and devata worship. So the most popular worship is known as Bhutakola. Yeah, so uh, I uh, so there basically um, there is this temple and then as per Agama the temple is constructed, right next to it there will be what we call as a Bhutasthana. 
and that is like a small hut or a house in which these daivas are placed and uh, it is recognized as their seat of presence so we either have a stone or a mask or a, 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 you know, just a wooden plate or even a bench so there are terms for those like either a kallu or a mogha or mane or a mancha that is typically the equivalent of the garbha griha of the uh, devata if you want to call it that way and then the worship uh, which at least happens once a year sometimes the frequency is more if it's a more prosperous uh, temple then there are various other forms of uh, worship but uh, at least once a year in in most temples a bhuta kola takes place and then this involves inviting the particular uh, deity the gana onto the body of uh, the person who uh, you know uh, tries to please it, it is, you know either a katunai or a nalikedai and then the you know sometimes it's termed as very violent but uh, like i said because of the nature of the devata uh, it's a very appropriate form of worship i would say so it is uh, this this actually was prevalent in many other forms of uh, i mean many other places of india and uh, south asia there's some research done which shows that similar worship is definitely existed in nepal uh, in maldives for example sri lanka i believe has uh, similar worship and i think some regions of tamil nadu also have uh, something very very uh, similar so deity um, you know uh, possession and worship is uh, um, not primitive or not uh, superstitious to say uh, there have been uh, some researchers like p gururaj bhat whom i quoted he himself has shown how in the vedas and in the puranas and in the mahabharata uh, the concept of avesha and possession is extremely prevalent it it is not at all an alien concept or at least uh, not alien to the vedic or dharmic concept at all it's just that uh, you know in the past 100 years or so there's a lot of suspicion around which uh, all of this is seen it calls for a lot of research and more understanding definitely but um, you know there's no reason to treat it as uh, primitive is what i would say the next one yeah so this is some slide showing the first one is a typical bhuta sthana i mean you will, you just take a drive in tulunadu you will see so many of these there will be some identified spots and some stones that's all uh, and there are some bhutas identified with it uh, the second one is shows the mogha or the mask uh, in you know if it's a little more prosperous place then you know they would have made a mogha out of it and kept it in the temple and then they have their own um, you know benches which is inside of those sthanas so the daivas themselves the bhutas themselves uh, four basic categories uh, you know we can place them into uh, yeah forget the type of their place so the tata mix so some of these bhutas like the pilichamundi and the panjurli they basically uh, you know animal forms the pilichamundi is actually a bhuta in the form of a tiger panjurli is a bhuta in the form of a, you know pig and so on and these are worshiped as you know uh, higher beings the second one is uh, you know there is some history associated with this there was some famous personality deified human who after his time has been elevated to the status of a bhuta or you know recognized as a, a devata who came down so there are number of them like annapa and babbaria koti chennaya is i think a very very famous example few some of you may know annapa by the way is uh, one of the daivas in uh, dharmasthala then there are a number of uh, bhutas which have which which uh, you know find their basis in the puranas i think rakteshwari and jumadi we call it jumadi it is uh, you know also referred to as dhumavati uh, very uh, known well known otherwise so uh, these are also worshiped as uh, daivas and then uh, due to incidents in some regions of uh, tulunad there are some daivas that have come up and they were originally restricted to those areas and then now they have moved around so uh, the daiva of ullal which is a region of uh, tulunad is ullal di and then um, from kodamannu there is one region so there is a daiva called kodamanithaya and so on so um, these are four categories of daivas that we worship uh, their worship is uh, in fact uh, conceptually similar to the 16 chodoshopachara pujaras done to the devata so we have what is called as a padnaji katle 16 elements of a kola so it will typically take maybe i mean you do it fast it can get over in 3 4 hours otherwise it spans the whole night typically the worship is done starting 9 or 10 in the evening and then goes on till early morning 
and then it consists of these uh, 16 uh, routines. Yeah, so some sample, you know, pictures from uh, Bhuta Kolas. I would have loved to play some videos. It will take a lot of time. Uh, but, uh, you know, the first one, for example, the, the makeup, all of this is natural. I mean, there are some communities who fall into four basic categories. Uh, and it's traditionally, it's a hereditary responsibility for those families. And uh, they don the, you know, uh, costume which they prepare themselves, include, I mean, including the jewelry. I mean, some of these are from uh, well-to-do temples. Otherwise, they, they come with their own jewelry, which is made out of uh, natural products, coconut leaves and coconut stem. And, you know, they literally use everything that's grown there. And uh, including their jewelry, costume, makeup, the colors, everything is natural and probably take two to three hours to get to this stage. And then for the next six, eight hours, the worship goes on. Um, so yeah, so the deities that I refer to, you know, uh, so the first two pictures are from the pictures on the top are from the first stage of the cola uh, the, out of the 16 that I mentioned. And then the ones at the bottom are, uh, you know, towards the later end where, you know, they have their own uh, elaborate probabilities and then the masks are placed on them. Uh, they have their own weapons. Each Bhuta has is identified with a weapon which is handed over. Another very uh, unique aspect of these daivas are that uh, the belief in them is so strong that they actually form a justice system of their own. Each and every of these kolas as out of the 16 cutlays, one of them is where the daiva dispenses justice. So villagers come to attend these uh, nemas to seek problems for their, you know, family disputes, um, disputes with the neighbor. Typically civil disputes, I mean, I think uh, criminal issues are not decided there. Government has taken over. But uh, otherwise, uh, it, it's still very, very prevalent. You know, land disputes, family disputes, brothers not talking to each other. And one good thing about this is inevitably the solution is a peaceful solution. Because the daiva is not going to tell you saying divide the property and go away. He'll somehow resolve and make them come together. And the word of the person who who dons the, the, the you know, Avesha of the Bhuta is uh, revered. I mean, otherwise he's a very normal person. In most cases, he could be even an illiterate, you know, as per our standards. But the respect is so much that his word is taken as, um, you know, God's word, the Daiva's word. And um, I would say a huge chunk of problems in our area are resolved because of Daivas. The belief on one side and then the actual justice system during the NEMA itself. Any question? So, one slide previous please. Yeah. So Devata and uh, Daiva Aradhana were two aspects. Another, I have a couple of things only. I'll finish quickly. Naga worship is another uh, very, very popular form of worship in Tulnad. Uh, the reason again is because Parashurama Kshetra, it is believed that, that when the land was vacated, they were like, thousands and thousands of snakes which got damaged. So uh, typically, you know, Naga worship is, uh, you know, very prevalent. And in fact, if people have problems, most often it turns out as, especially with regard to progeny or marriage and so on. And then astrology will reveal that there is a Naga, uh, you know, dosha or a Naga worship. Very, very uh, popular and uh, very much believed. Uh, again, there are some uniqueness here. I mean, we have Naga Banas and then the idols of Naga everywhere. But we also do have some forms of worship which are unique over here. So two of them at least I can think of is uh, one we, what we call as a Naga Mandala and the other one is what is called as a Dakhe Bali. They're very similar. Uh, just go to the next uh, picture, please. So this is just uh, something that will show you how a Naga Mandala takes place. There's a... There's a Rangoli, I, I don't know what is the appropriate English word, but that's drawn. And then typically there is a design of a snake drawn, uh, you know, in it, uh, two snakes actually. And they are tied up in knots. And as you can see there, this one has, I think, four knots. So that's the minimum number of knots in a Nagabandala that you can try. And it can go from 4, 8, 12 and 16. 16 is the highest. And then the whole uh, night, there is this worship where the Naga Patri, the one standing there in the other picture, and then there is a Vaidya who has this musical instrument which is pleasing to the Naga. And then they go around dancing around the Naga Mandala. It sometimes goes on, depending on the number of knots, it can go on for even eight hours. And then uh, they basically, it is said that they actually 
tie themselves up in the form of the knot itself and then un- un- untie them again that dancing involves the whole uh, ritual and um, you know a very very popular very costly but very popular form of uh, worship these days and uh, the patri actually the naga likes the uh, areka flower so on the picture on the right there uh, that's what he is holding the areka nut tree has a flower which has its own unique uh, you know pleasant smell and then the custom is that uh, he should never run out of that flower during the nagamandala so you have this custom where well, entire villages come to nagamandala and literally you have uh, I mean i don't know mounds and mounds of these uh, areka nut flowers and all of which is exhausted during the 8 hour uh, festival so again something very unique uh, that uh, form of worship there uh, next and yeah, the final uh, one i am can think of is the tatvavada siddhanta we uh, the region has contributed to vedanta as well madhvacharya was one of the main uh, you know acharyas of the vedanta sampradayas he was born there and his whole uh, his headquarters was in udupi and then of course born in pajaka still very fi- widely followed um, a number of mathas have been established in tulunad the most famous among them are the ashtamathas which uh, you know are revolve around the udupi temple and take turns uh, worshiping uh, shri krishna yeah so uh, you know couple of slides on my analysis my take on this whole thing i think uh, one of the unique ne- things about tulu nadu is how seamlessly all these practices have uh, integrated with each other so like i said you know there were the, the bhuta nemas and the kolas and the naga worship predates the worship of temples and then uh, the brahmins are brought over and then temples came in but now they coexist so sarva dharma samabhav in the true sense is here uh, obviously because sarva dharma samabhav can happen only between uh, dharmas only dharmic aspects only so um, so from something from the old to the new the simple simple to the complex all of them coexist there like i said agama and daiva worship coexist and then uh, you know naga and dakkabali worship also you know existing with the vedic practices next slide please so another unique part is uh, there are numerous shaiva and shakta temples in our region but because of the uh, spreading of the tatvavada philosophy of shri madhvacharya madhvas are the majority in tulunad so it's one of those places where you will find madhvas worshiping shiva and uh, shakti and subramanya temples and uh, again i find that a unique system and the other practice that we see is uh, ganapati worship predates uh, shri madhvacharya and popularizing of the vaishnava cult so we have temples of vishnu murti where krishna um, ganapati idols are present and both of them are worshiped together so uh, without causing a problem again uh, the uh, people speaking the konkani language because of you know the you know incidents in the uh, 15th century 16th century we have um, you know konkana worship in our region as well we do have separate temples but largely you know peaceful and coexistent that is again uh, unique nature and then um, non hindu and uh, but indic systems supporting Uh, worship here so the jainas have been rulers of uh, tulunadu were rulers for a long time uh, even today dharmasthala uh, the, the administrative family is uh, they are jains so the jains administer uh, shaiva temple which is worshiped by madhvas it is a very very unique place and there are a number of other examples putike is another such uh, example in our area where jaina rulers uh, continue to support uh, in whatever limited form they can Uh, worship of our temples yeah so uh, just the last uh, set of points uh, why i believe this survival and growth has been possible one of the strong points i see is that the uh, the education in schools you know the secular education in schools still has a lot of dharmic element in it i mean we do have the problems um, government schools um, you know not not allow to teach and so on but somehow uh, it has survived the kids are still taught aspects of our religion and culture and temples and nemas at home and in schools there is this practice of so many schools being closely associated with temples and coming for temple visits and so on which i feel is a big contributing factor very early in their childhood uh, it is very normal it becomes very normal for them to you know be aware of these forms of worship and you know 
um, participate in them and again like i said it's a core of life whatever we do uh, th- there is religion and uh, spirituality involved and uh, the other aspect i feel is uh, there is a lot of pride in the activity um, there is a lot of premium placed on change uh, each and every aspect is highly ritualized i think that has its own value the moment you highly ritualize it doesn't mean that it's not open for change but then that change comes as a result of a lot of scrutiny and uh, i believe over it takes its own time but the right changes take place so um, that could be one example of how you know preservation and growth of uh, other elements of our culture can be I, we need not devalue the um, you know concept of rituals in our uh, practice yeah that's what i meant the other one is uh, the final point here is about the utsavas itself uh, i think the speaker in the morning was saying about how so many of the communities don't turn up somehow that concept has survived here so even today this the you know four day or the five day festival each and every community in the village has its assigned designated role and because of their early education they will never give up it's a it's a matter of pride for them they will turn up for those festivals and participate very keenly i believe that is one of the strong reasons why this has continued for so long so even in the pariyaya yesterday which we were talking about something that happens once every two years there is this custom of every village uh, taking its uh, horakanike and giving it to the udupi temple from as far as kasurgod people come and bring their uh, horakanike and give it it's just a ritual not that the temple really needs those uh, you know 50 kilos of rice or 10 coconuts that they bring but it's a custom they have to give and the temple has to accept so examples like this are abound each and every aspect of the utsava brings out an element of participation from the uh, community and i strongly believe that has led to uh, the survival yeah that's what i wanted to talk thank you for the opportunity and namaste